such a good audience for this meeting, this the meeting to mark the third anniversary of the February Revolution. Um, as you know, the uprising has continued unabated ever since February 2011, in spite of the relentless efforts of the Al Khalifa dictators to suppress it by extrajudicial executions, by torture, arbitrary arrests, deprivation of citizenship, and attempts to deny the people's right to freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. This inhuman strategy has utterly failed to quell the spirit of the people who are more determined than ever that the Al Khalifa family must go. The most popular chant at the demonstrations in the villages is Yes Kat Hamad, meaning down with Hamad. There is of course a law making it illegal to insult King Hamad, as you find in most dictatorships, but Hamad has gone one better now by increasing the penalties for this so-called offence. You risk a seven-year prison sentence plus a fine of £16,300, a bit of an increase on the four months that Zainab al Khawaja got for tearing up a picture of the king recently. The European Parliament has called for the release of Zainab, of her father, the esteemed human rights activist, who as you know is serving a life sentence, uh, Ibrahim Sharif, Nabil Rajab, head of the Bahrain Centre for Human Rights, and all other prisoners of conscience, political activists, journalists, human rights defenders, and peaceful protesters who are arbitrarily detained by the regime. And we would like to see the EU foreign policy chief, Cathy Ashton, going to Manama to present this list of demands by the European Parliament. It would also be good if the UN Special Procedures would make a joint report for the March meeting of the UN Human Rights Council on Bahrain's killings, tortures, and arbitrary detentions. The UN Rapporteur on Torture was, as you know, originally invited by the regime, but the invitation was cancelled, <clears throat> and there is no sign that it will be revived in the foreseeable future. But the rapporteurs have plenty of evidence of abuses, and the March Council meeting would be the time to consider that evidence. Meanwhile, al Wefaq has set conditions for the resumption of the collapse so-called political dialogue. They also want the political prisoners to be released, including the Bahrain 13. They want a parliament with full legislative powers, a government chosen by the people, equality of all citizens, reform of the judiciary, fair and transparent elections supervised by an independent electoral commission, a guarantee of equality between all citizens, and an end to the policy of extra-legally naturalizing foreigners. That's the list of demands which has been presented by al wefaq Now, the last process that I mentioned, the extrajudicial uh, uh, naturalizing of foreigners, that's a process which has been going on for some years, as revealed in the Bandargate report. We're delighted to have Dr. Salah al Bandar this morning with us, and he'll be speaking to you later. He showed that there was a conspiracy to alter the demographic balance in Bahrain, turning it into a Sunni-majority country in the expectation that the native Shia would be put in their place electorally. And although the struggle for democracy in Bahrain has never been expressed in sectarian terms, the al Khalifas have used the sectarian card by systematically excluding the Shia from public life and the professions and by demolishing their mosques and matams. It's impossible to conceive that the al Khalifas would agree to the al Wefaq's list of preconditions for talks, but they may try to keep talks about talks going in an attempt to prevent unification of the opposition. For the time being, there is a division, as you know, between the constitutionalists, who believe that progress can be made by negotiations with the regime, and the realists, as I call them, who say that the dictators will never relinquish any of their power voluntarily. But the split has narrowed if al Wefaq means that roadmap has to be guaranteed before they will sit down at the table. It is not clear to me how that could be accomplished. Perhaps they have in mind some kind of international oversight of the process. What al Wefaq might like to stipulate is that some reforms should be enacted before the talks start 
instead of being merely items on the agenda. The release of the political prisoners is the obvious one to pick because those activists have earned the right to play an important role in any transitional process towards a democratic system. As President Obama told the Bahrain government soon after the start of the uprising in 2011, you can't have a real dialogue when parts of the peaceful opposition are in jail. Failure to heed that advice has encouraged many people to think that the regime intends to hold on to their power by hook or by crook. Their foiled attempt to buy enormous quantities of gas grenades from South Korea may have been an indicator that the hardliners are in control and the Crown Prince's manoeuvres are no more than a trick to keep our wefak docile. Of one thing I'm certain, the UK's behaviour is not helping the situation. Not only are any criticisms that we make sotto voce, so they can't be heard by the public, but not only have we failed to point out, following President Obama, that there's no hope of a peaceful political outcome to the revolution, while there are Mandela-like figures in prison, but we all give the al Khalifa's red carpet treatment when they come here, uh, like at Ascot, at Sandhurst and Buckingham Palace. Last month, Prince Andrew visited Bahrain and our ambassador told the Gulf Daily News that he had a close relationship with King Hamad and the Crown Prince, two of the pinnacles of the repression. As long as the despots know that they have such powerful support from the British establishment, why should they bother making concessions? And we'll no doubt hear a lot more about that later. But now I have great pleasure in calling on the first of our speakers, who is Dr. Abdul Hadi Khalaf, former MP, lecturer at the University of Lund, Sweden, to speak to you.